church we just wanted to take a minute right at the very beginning of this message just to share with you i'm sure many of you have already heard but we lost one of our uh, church family this week and it's uh, you know obviously when this kind of thing happens it's it's devastating isn't it and it can be a real shock and so we just wanted to take a moment right at the very beginning just to uh, honor her life and to uh, show love and respect to the family and so we're just going to play a short song for you just to allow some space to allow a moment to uh, reflect on uh, life and on uh, God's presence in really challenging and tough situations so why don't we just take a minute right now just to uh, just to seek God to uh, send our love and, and prayers to the family at this time
So if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, you'll be aware that we've been working through a series entitled Living My Best Life. And we started off talking about the idea that we should live a surrendered life, that we need to take all of our plans and and any thoughts around what our future might look like. And we need to hand it over to God and say, do you know what, God, your will be done in my life, not my own. You take control. You take the driver's seat and let's see together where we can go and and what great things we can accomplish when we work in partnership with God, when we surrender our lives to him. And then last week we talked about living a surrounded life. We looked at this uh, this idea that we've had, we have surrounded by a great cloud of, of witnesses, these, these incredible men and women of faith who have gone before us and, and given us this example of the kind of lives that we can live when we work in partnership with God. And we also talked about the importance of, of recognising those who we allow into our, our circle, uh, our sphere of life and, and making sure that they're people who speak life into us, that they're people who build us up, that they're people who sharpen us and make us better people and not people that speak death and and try to pull us down and enable us to do those things that are are self-destructive. So it's important that we live a surrounded life, surrounded by men and women of faith, surrounded by people who are going to build us up and, and encourage us to be better people. And so today we want to continue with this series and we're going to look at the idea of living a restored life, living a restored life. You know, society, especially social media, it can encourage us to uh, to show people our best life by essentially by putting on a facade, by by showing people a, a fake side of us, by pretending that our lives look incredible when in truth behind closed doors, they perhaps don't look amazing. So these snapshots that we share with those around us may look like we have, you know, the perfect family and we may have, uh, you know, br- look at these brand new clothes or look at this amazing dinner party that, that I'm attending. You know, there's all these kind of things that we're willing to take a snapshot of and share with the world. But is that really what life looks like behind closed doors? I don't know about you, but life in our household can be pretty 
chaotic, you know, from kids waking up at 5.30, 6 a.m. in the morning and climbing into bed, which does not make us happy people and sets us up for, a, you know, quite a, a tough day. And then moving into, I don't know, tantrums about doing schoolwork and, and then having meal times where we're spending so much time trying to calm down these hyped up crazy kids that we get indigestion be just trying to you know bring them under some kind of control and and then maybe if we're lucky having even a hint of energy left after these kids have gone to bed that's what life looks like for us now don't hear me don't hear me wrong i love my children and they are incredible and and the reality is that while that might look like the picture of our life a lot of the time it's not all the time Sometimes there are these moments where, I don't know, we'll, we'll look in and, and the boys are playing really nicely together and they get so creative and imaginative in their play and it's just amazing to watch. Or, or I don't know, we're, we're hanging out as a family and we're, we're doing a devotional together or we're having a movie night with some popcorn. I don't know, maybe the kids have gone to bed well and, and Ruth and I are able to just get some time for ourselves and we could read a book or watch a movie or treat ourselves to a takeaway. I don't know what it is. And, and, and the reality of life is that there's this balance, isn't there? You know, sometimes life can be chaotic and crazy and a bit mental. And then, and then other times there can be these, these picture perfect moments in our lives. But I think oftentimes it's, it's only those picture perfect moments that we want to share with people because we want to make it look like, hey, look at me. I really am living my best life. But God wants us to be authentic. God wants, to live, wants us to live authentic lives. Let me read to you uh, Psalm 23. It's, it's a psalm that most of us will know very well. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love the language that David uses in this psalm. You know, he doesn't want for anything. He feels at peace. He feels protected. He feels secure. Blessings and joy are overflowing. They're in abundance. And I think that if you were to take this psalm as a standalone piece of writing, if you were just to look at this psalm, you you can almost, I don't know, imagine the, the Instagram photos. There's, you know, here's a selfie of me lying down in this beautiful, lush, green field. And then here's another snapshot of, of David sitting at this, this incredible table filled with the most fantastic food you've ever seen in your life. And then here's another snapshot. It's just me and Jesus hanging out. And you kind of get this idea that maybe David's showing us that he really is living his best life when you read this psalm. But that's not his life 24-7, just in the same way that those pictures that we might share are not our lives 24-7. And that's why I love the, the balance and the contrast between Psalm 23 and the psalm that comes before it. Because what it does is it takes this picture that we've seen painted for us by David's word in Psalm 23 where I don't want for anything and I lie in these beautiful fields and, you know, God is protecting me and providing for me. But then it shows that actually some authenticity and it shows that there's a balance to life when you look at the words that he speaks in Psalm 22. Let me read some for you. He begins this psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry day by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. And then skip on a few verses and he says, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. 
You know, these, these two Psalms, they're such polar opposites, aren't they? You might even think that they've been written by two different people, but they were both written by David. And I think in reality, it shows what life can be like. You see, one minute we can feel like God's deserted us and we can feel alone and we can feel helpless and hopeless. We can find ourselves stuck in a situation that we never thought we would be facing with no clue how we're going to come out of this on the other side. And then in the next moment, in the next breath, we, we sense his presence and we feel him draw near to us and we become filled with, with peace and with love and with joy. And then because of that kind of overflowing of, of joy and, and of his presence, we want to tell the whole world about just how awesome our God is. So David goes from the devastation of Psalm 22 into the, the abundance of joy that we find in Psalm 23. And there's this beautiful balance of the reality of what life can look like for all of us. In Psalm 22, David feels forsaken, like God has left him. And then in Psalm 23, he feels shepherded by a God who cares. In Psalm 22, his soul is in restless agony. But then in Psalm 23, it says his soul is restored because now he finds himself resting in the presence of his father. You know, what I love about this is that David goes on this journey that in reality, most of us go on through our lives. We find that there's these, these highs and then there's these lows and they can be followed by another high. And it's not a, a, just a straight, easy journey, this life that we live. It can be full of shocks and surprises and things that, that knock us and, and take us off track. But throughout it all, what David is saying to us, throughout it all, God is with us. You see, we can go on these journeys from, from panic to peace and, and from chaos to order and from, from a sense of restlessness to a sense of restoration. The reality is that we weren't meant to go through life's challenges alone. We're meant to do this journey surrounded, like we talked about last week. We're meant to do this journey surrounded by men and women of faith and surrounded by the presence of God through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. We're meant to do this life, this journey in partnership with God. In Matthew 11, it says, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When we draw close to God, we find rest. Why is that? Because, because he restores us, because he takes us back to the way that things should be. You know, we've become burdened and we've become weighed down with the weight on our, of the world on our shoulders. But when we look to him, when we draw close to God, he, he replaces that, that heaviness of heart or, or the weight that's on our shoulders with something that becomes much more manageable. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's how we should live our lives. So if you find yourself right now and you're, you're living this life where you feel like you're just burdened and you're, you're full of the weight of, of all of the stress and anxiety of whatever situation you may be finding yourselves in right now, I encourage you to draw close to God, to fix your eyes on him, to find true rest in his presence and allow him to restore you. Because God wants us to live a restored life. You know, the Bible describes believers as, as jars of clay. We're jars, we're the jars and, and we're carrying this incredible treasure, the very presence of God. But, but jars of clay, if you just look at them on their own, they're, they're ordinary, everyday items. There's absolutely nothing special about a jar made of clay. But, but then when you put something special inside of it, it then becomes a precious item because it's holding this thing of great worth. 
And I think that what this this picture does is it allows us to to recognise that our ordinary everyday lives can be more clearly through, show the incredible power and awesomeness of God because because we're just this this clay pot we're just this clay jar but but God is inside of us His presence is within us and so so actually through His power and through His glory and through His grace. Only by those things can we do anything that we do. We need to work in partnership with him. We need to declare things in his name. It's not in John's name be done, it's in Jesus' name be done. It's not through us, but it's through him. It's not I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. You know, jars of clay, they're, they're ordinary, they're, they're everyday items. And, and the reality is that they can be quite weak. They're just, they're just cheap pots that are, that are made quickly to, to do their job. And, and because of that, they can become quite weak. And the reality is that if you put them under too much pressure or if they get knocked or dropped, then bits will begin to break off them or, or they'll smash into pieces. And I think that can be a picture of our lives, can't it? Because when we get put under pressure, the pressure of maybe, you know, society telling us that we need to achieve a certain thing to be to be to appear as successful. When we're under that pressure, then cracks can begin to appear in our lives. You know, when we get knocked by critical words or by betrayal or hurt, then a piece of us might break off. Or maybe a a situation hits us with such force that we feel like we've just been dropped and and broken into a thousand tiny pieces. That's real life. If that's how you feel this morning, then I want to tell you that it's not just you, it's me and, and everyone around us. We all feel that life is fragile and at any moment we could break or crumble or be destroyed. But that's not what God wants for us. That's not what he wants for us. You know, there's a a Japanese art form called Kintsukuroi, and it literally means golden repair. I, I love this picture because what they do is they take broken bits of pottery and then they put them together and repair them with this lacquer mixed with gold. And what you get is this philosophy that that treats cracks and and brokenness and damaged goods as actually part of the history of this jar, of this pot. They don't don't try and hide or disguise it by, by painstakingly smoothing over the cracks. What they do is they highlight the brokenness with gold so that it becomes this beautiful, unique masterpiece of broken pieces put together with this precious gold. The brokenness isn't, isn't hidden, it's illuminated. You know, the pot doesn't become useless. I think we live in a, a society when, when things get broken or, or even chipped a little bit, we just discard them and I'll just buy something new. But in, in this case, you know, the pot doesn't become useless or thrown away because it's broken, it's mended, it's, it's healed. And then the beauty, the real beauty can shine through. It's the same way that as we go through challenges, as we go through difficulties, as we face kind of pressure and stress and anxiety, God carefully and painstakingly and lovingly puts the pieces of our lives back together. He restores us. He makes us whole. He takes our imperfections, our cracks and our brokenness and he puts them back together so that through the the gold that's piecing those pieces together, his glory, his peace, his grace, his love can shine through our lives. Because we've not just recognised that our lives are broken and and shattered and we've thrown it away, but because we've allowed God to restore us and put us back together and mend us and make us whole once again. And that speaks volumes to those around us. Because we live in a world where, where stress and pressure are among so many people. 
and they struggle to get through life's stresses and pressures and circumstances. But when we as believers allow God to restore us, to, to put us back together, to, to use his glory to mend us into wholeness once again, that speaks to those around us and they say, how on earth are you going through this situation and still showing love and joy? They're like, what is it that you've got? What is it that's inside of you that's allowing you to to get through this circumstance or this situation? And it's that precious thing that's inside of this ordinary, everyday jar of clay. The very presence of God. The very presence of God. I love that he he longs to, to pick up the pieces and the broken mess of our lives and restore us. And make us this unique and precious masterpiece of his creation. But do you know, restoration takes time, doesn't it? Restoration takes time. It's, it's not a process that can be rushed. It's not a process that you can just throw together. It needs to be done with care. And it needs to be, gone, be, be done with love. And that's why I think in Psalm 23, David talks about the importance and this idea of rest. We need to pause. When we find ourselves in situations and circumstances that seem overwhelming to us, we need to pause. We need to rest. We need to look to Jesus and allow him to restore us, to make us whole again. You know, David knew that God was with him as he was going through the the kind of inner turmoil of Psalm 22. He knew in reality, he knew within himself that God was with him, that God cared for him, that God would never leave him. Even though he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew in reality that God was with him, that God was for him. There was no battle that David couldn't face with God in his life. And I believe that's what it looks like to live a restored life. If you want to live your best life, you not only need to surrender it to God and surround yourselves with people who are for you and love God, but you need to live a restored life. You need to hand over the broken, shattered mess of your life to God and say, help me, help me put this back together and create something out of me that can be for your glory. We need to live a restored life. And the other thing about these two psalms is that they both point to Jesus. They both point to Jesus. You see, Psalm 22, it's a description of David's struggles, isn't it? But it's also a description of what Jesus went through, which I'm sure we'll all agree is something that's much worse than anything we will ever face. You know, David felt as though God had forsaken him and he cried out those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words that we will recognise that Jesus cried out from the cross. Because in that moment on the cross where he took on all the pain and all the sin and all the suffering of this world, in that moment, God could no longer look at his son and he turned his face away from him. And Jesus cried out, those words in agony, in pain, in loneliness in that sense. Jesus knows how you feel. Jesus knows what you're going through. He knows that turmoil, that anguish that you may be feeling, no matter what it is that you're going through. And out of that empathy, he's able to say, I'm with you, I'm for you, I love you. He's cried those cries of desperation. He's made those shouts. He's, he's asked God where he is in any circumstance and situation. He can absolutely relate to what you're going through. And I don't know about you, when, when I'm going through something that, that's, that's challenging me or, or I'm struggling with it, it's really helpful to find someone who's gone through it before you. And you can say, you know, I don't know, how did you get through this? Or even sometimes it's just a case of, of talking to them knowing that they understand. Because you might think that anyone else who, who hasn't been through it doesn't really get it. They don't really understand and they might say, ah, oh, that's, that's bad or, or you'll get through it or, or whatever. But you know in reality they don't fully grasp the truth of what it is that you're saying. But when you share with someone who's been through it before, when you share it with someone who can relate, 
there's a connection that happens that that brings an ease that actually allows this transaction to release this heavy burden and replace it with something manageable because my yoke is easy and my burden is light God says and so it's through the action of Jesus it's through that moment on the cross where he cried out in desperation and then he died and then three days later he rose again and it's because of that incredible sacrifice and that incredible miracle of of conquering death that he was able to not only restore himself back to life but restore the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father because in that moment as he rose again as he conquered death that means that whenever we invite Jesus into our lives that separation between us and God has been restored No longer are we not able to have direct access to our Father in heaven. We can now call on him. We can now cry out to him. We can now ask him to help us. And there's this interaction with us that that once was broken, but now is restored because of the action of Jesus, because he paid the price for our eternal restoration. And it's this restoration that, that releases David to sing out that Psalm 23, because he recognises that the Good Shepherd has already gone before him and laid down his life for his sheep and, and that he gives us peace and joy and provision and safety and comfort and all those things that David talks about in Psalm 23. Because our Good Shepherd, he's, he's walked through that valley before us and he's walked through that valley for us he's walked through it before us and he's he's walked through it for us he was betrayed and mocked and beaten and broken so that we can be restored to our father in heaven for all eternity you know i closed last week with the words from john 16 and they speak into this message as well it says i have said these things to you that in me you may have peace In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, take heart, I have overcome the world. What encouraging words to us, you know, the reality is that we all go through these valleys and and hopefully we'll come out of the other side, but you know, the pain of Psalm 22, the pain that we see David going through as he wrestles with this internal agony, We can relate to that and that might be our cry for the night. But know this, that in the morning, the joy of Psalm 23 will come through. That we will make it through those times of pain and of hurt and of anguish. But in the morning, in the morning, through God's grace, through his love, we'll be able to sing of his goodness. We'll be able to sing of his love and his grace. And it'll be so overwhelming that we'll want to shout about it. That we'll want to say, look at what God has done through me. Look at this incredible way that he has pieced our lives back together and restored me back to wholeness once again. And his love shines through. It shines through those cracks in our lives that have been pieced back together with his precious gold. And his love will shine through. You know, that that sound of Psalm 23, it's a sound that speaks of a father who will never leave us. Leave us. It's the sound of a father who is our who is our great provider, who is our prince of peace. Those are the sounds that will come when we rest in his presence, when we seek his face, when we ask for his help, when we share our burdens with him. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Let me close with this. In in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says, So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore. He will restore, support, and strengthen you. And then he'll place you on a firm foundation. So after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, he will strengthen, and he will place you on a firm foundation. 
I've got absolutely no doubt that we all want to live our best life, that we all want to live in this incredible abundance that God has promised for us. That's what we want. If, if you don't want that, then, well, I think you're crazy. You know, we need to want to live in this incredible life. So I encourage us all to let's be authentic with God. Let's be authentic with those around us. Wouldn't that be bold? Let's not try to hide from God. Let's not try to hide our pain from him. Let's cry out in pain. Let's let's shout out in desperation because he's been before us. He's been through it. He he understands. So let's not hide from God, but let's take our burdens to him. The Bible says we should lay them down at his feet. We shouldn't hide from God, but we should draw close. There's nothing more important in moments of struggle and stress and anxiety and pain than drawing close to God. I think the natural response often can be to withdraw and to to pull ourselves away from those around us and from God. But the reality is you need to draw close to him. Whatever it is that you're facing today, I pray that you will draw close to God, that you will share your heart with him, that you will share your burdens with him because as you draw close to him, he draws close to you because he loves you, because he's for you. We need to surrender our lives to God. If we want to live this best life, we need to surrender our lives to God. We need to live our surrounded life with with those who have gone before us and set a great example of faith for us, but also with those around us, those that, that are for us, those that love us, and those that love God. And thirdly, we need to draw close to him. We need to draw close to God in in hard times and and allow him to restore us. Allow him to do this incredible, beautiful masterpiece of restoring the brokenness of our lives back to wholeness in him. Why don't we pray? (coughs) Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for the incredible sacrifice that you made for us when you went to the cross, when you took on all sin and all shame. And we thank you that ultimately that cross led to the restoration of our relationship with our Heavenly Father and we are so eternally grateful for that. So I pray today that for anyone that's that's watching, that's listening today, that, that whatever it is that they're facing, whatever anxieties and stresses and pressures and circumstances are going on in, in their lives, that they will recognise that we shouldn't withdraw, that we shouldn't hide from you, but we should draw close, that we should draw near, that we should find true rest in your presence and allow you to do that work of restoration so that you can bring us together, so that you can put us back together, so that you can make us whole once again and your glory and your grace and your love will shine through the cracks of our lives. So we thank you that that we are broken messes. We shouldn't be ashamed of that because that's our story. It's part of our history. It's part of who we are. But we are thankful and eternally grateful that you are there to pick up the pieces to put us back together and to bring us and make us whole. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, thank you for for tuning in. Before you go this morning, I just want to introduce to us, uh, we're about to start a, a brand new digital life group series. So starting on Wednesday evening, we're going to start through a new series uh, entitled Life Is. It's a series by Pastor Judah Smith. Um, It's an incredible series that I've done before and it it fit in so well with the series, the preaching series that we're currently going through. So I thought, why not? Let's uh, let's be a part of this. So uh, if you got one of the journals last time, then there's a journal on its way to you uh, right now. If you didn't and you want one, then uh, let us know and we will get one to you. Just drop us a message, uh, head to our website, social media, whatever it is, get in touch, let us know um, and we'll get one of those journals out to you. And then Wednesday night, 7.30pm, we'll begin our Zoom Life Group series and it's going to run for six weeks and there's some uh, devotionals and stuff that in the journal that we can be working through in between those sessions. So when you get your journal, keep hold of it. We'll 
do the first series together, uh, the first video, and then during the week you can be working through those devotionals. It's video teaching, so what we'll do is we'll arrive on Zoom, uh, we'll say hello, we'll have a bit of a catch up, and then we'll all go away, watch the video 15, 20 minutes long, and then we'll come back and have a time of discussion and some prayer. Uh, and I think it should be awesome. So uh, why don't you watch this trailer um, so you can hear what it's all about. Life is blank. How would you fill in the blank? What is life about? Life is love. Life is success. Life is money. Life is family. What is life? Life is career. What are we here for? What's the purpose? What, what's the point? And how we fill in the blank, if that's defining our life, are we happy? Am I happy? Are you happy? To me, how you answer, how you fill in that blank is maybe the single most important question in the whole wide world. What's more important than answering that question? What is life all about? What's the purpose and, and what's the meaning? I wanna personally invite you to join me and many others on this journey of not only asking the question, what is life all about, but answering the question. Well, it's time to give. And um, Malachi 3 verse 10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it, says the Lord of hosts. And that's a great promise, isn't it? But do you know what? There's another promise after that. And in verse 11 it says this, and it's just as important. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fa fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And how wonderful is that, that as we give to God, he fulfills his promise to us. And you know, God says that when we give the tithe to him, when we honour him with our money, we show him he's first, not money and you know he honors us not just in that overflow of blessing like in the first part of the verse but in protection from the devourer the one who wants to take it all from us so you know sometimes we can put away our tithe money in a reluctant way and we're not a cheerful giver anymore because we feel like you know the devourer is going to take it something's going to there's going to be you know a rainy day or or a, you know an emergency but you know what, um, while it's wise to do that and you know there's biblical principles for that, it's also wise to tithe and put some money aside in that area as well. Because you know what, um, God is more faithful with, the, with that 90% that you've got that you know in the 100% that you've got. Because when we give that tenth or that tithe to him, he looks after us, which is a wonderful promise. So let's just, you know, let's just pray and don't forget that if, if Hope Church is not your home, home church, your tithe goes to your home church. So let's pray. Lord, today I bring my tithe and I thank you for helping me to do this. In your word, you said that when I bring my tithe into your house, you will rebuke the devourer for my sake. I believe it and I receive it and I have faith in your word. Thank you for your abundant blessing. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Well, it's time to say goodbye for another week, but please keep in touch with us. We'd love to know how you're doing. We want to pray for you. And, you know, if you need anything, just let us know. And have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Bye.